course, especially at a moment when intellectual pleasures await you. Your German grammar is on the table. Pray open it to page 15 and we will repeat yesterday's lesson. But I don't like German. I know perfectly well that it makes me look quite plain. It's not a very becoming language. <laughs> Child, you know how anxious your guardian is that you should improve yourself in every way. He laid particular stress on your German as he was leaving for town yesterday. Indeed, he always lays stress on your German when he's leaving for town. Dear Uncle Jack is so very serious. Sometimes he is so serious, I think he cannot be quite well. Your guardian enjoys the best of health. And this quality of demeanor is especially to be commended in one so comparatively young as he is. I know no one who has a higher sense of duty and responsibility. I suppose that is why he often looks a little bored when we three are together. Cecily, I'm surprised at you. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. I know merriment and triviality would be out of place in his conversation. You must remember his constant anxiety about that unfortunate young man, his brother. I wish Uncle Jack would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down here sometimes. We, we might have a good influence over in this prism. I'm sure you certainly would. You know German and geology, and things of that kind can influence a man very much. <laughs> I do not think that even I could have any effect on a character. That by his own brother's admission is irretrievably weak and vacillating. Indeed, I do not think that I would desire to reclaim him. I am not in favor of this modern name of turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. As a man sows, so let him reap. <laughs> you should put away your diary, Cecily. I don't know why you keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I should probably forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary we all carry about with us. Yes, but it usually chronicles the things that have never happened and couldn't possibly have happened. I think that memory is responsible for nearly all the three-volume novels that Newton sent us. Do not speak slightingly of the three-volume novel, Cecily. <laughs> I wrote one myself in younger days. Did you really, Miss Prism? How wonderfully clever you are. I hope it did not end happily. I don't like novels that end happily. They depress me so much. The good end happily and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. I suppose so. But it seems very unfair. And was your novel never published? Alas, no. The manuscript, unfortunately, was abandoned. I use the word in the sense of lost or mislaid. But to your work, child, these speculations are profitless. But I see dear Dr. Chasuble coming up through the garden. Dr. Chasuble, this is indeed a pleasure. And how are we this morning? Miss Prism, you are, I trust, well. Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache. I think it would do her so much good to go on a short stroll with you in the park, Dr. Chasuble. Cecily, I have not mentioned anything about a headache. No, dear Miss Prism, I know that, but I felt instinctively that you had a headache. <laughs> Indeed, I was thinking about that and not about my German lesson when the rector came in. Cecily, I hope you're not inattentive. Oh, I'm afraid I am. That is strange. Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang up on her lips. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke metaphorically. <laughs> My metaphor was drawn from bees. <laughs> I suppose Mr. Worthing has not returned from town yet? Uh, we do not expect him till Monday afternoon. Ah, yes. He usually likes to spend his Sunday in London. He's not one of those who so lay his enjoyment, as by all accounts that unfortunate young man his brother seems to be. Well, I must not detain Egeria and her pupil any longer. Egeria? My name is Letitia, Doctor. The classical illusion, Mary, drawn from the pagan authors. I shall see you both, no doubt, at evil songs. I think, dear Doctor, that I will have a stroll with you. I find I do have a headache after all, and a walk would do it good. With pleasure, Miss yeah. Prism, with pleasure. We might go as far as the schools in there. That would be delightful. Cecily, you will read your political economy 
during my absence. The chapter on the fall of the rupee you may omit. It is so much too sensational. <laughs> Even these metallic problems have their melodramatic side. Horrid political economy. Horrid geography. Horrid, horrid German. <laughs> Mr. Ernest Worthing has just come up from the station. He's brought his luggage with him. Mr. Ernest Worthing, before the Albany W. Uncle Jack's brother. Uh, did you tell him Mr. Worthing was in town? Yes, miss. He seemed very much disappointed. I told him that you and Miss Prism were in the garden. He said that he wanted to have a word with you privately for a moment. Ask Mr. Ernest Worthing to come here, and I suppose you had better talk to the housekeeper about a room for him. Yes, miss. I have never met any really wicked person before. I feel rather frightened. I am so afraid he will look just like everyone else. <laughs> He does. <laughs> you are my little cousin Cecily, I'm sure. You are under some strange mistake. I am not little. In fact, I believe I am more than usually tall for my age. You, I know from your card, are Uncle Jack's brother. I am your cousin Cecily. You are Uncle Jack's brother, my wicked cousin Ernest. <laughs> Oh, I'm not really wicked at all, Cousin Cecily. You mustn't think that I'm wicked. <laughs> if you are not, then you have certainly been deceiving us all in a very inexcusable manner. I hope you have not been leading a double life, pretending to be wicked and being really good all the time. <laughs> that would be hypocrisy. Well, I have been <laughs> rather reckless. I am glad to hear it. In fact, now that you mention the subject, I've been very bad, in my own small way. <laughs> I don't think you should be so proud of that, though I am sure it must have been very pleasant. It is much pleasanter being here with you. I can't understand how you're here at all. Uncle Jack won't be back till Monday afternoon. Yes, that is a great disappointment. I am obliged to go up on the first train on Monday morning. I have a business appointment that I am anxious to miss. Couldn't you miss it anywhere but in London? Uh, no, the appointment is in London. Oh. Well, of course I know how important it is not to keep a business engagement if one wants to retain any sense of the beauty of life. But still, I think you had better wait till Uncle Jack arrives. I know he wanted to speak to you about your immigrating. About my what? Your immigrating. He has gone up to buy your outfit. <laughs> I wouldn't let Jack buy my outfit. He has no taste in neckties at all. I don't think you will require neckties. Uncle Jack is sending you to Australia. Australia? I'd sooner die. Well, he said at dinner on Wednesday night that you would have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. <laughs> the accounts I have received of Australia and the next world are not particularly encouraging. Now, this world is good enough for me, Cousin Cecily. Yes, but are you good enough for it? I'm afraid I'm not that. <laughs> That's why I want you to reform me. You might make that your mission, if you don't mind, Cousin Cecily. I am afraid I have no time this afternoon. Well, would you mind my reforming myself this afternoon? It is rather quixotic of you, but I think you should try. I will. <laughs> I feel better already. <laughs> you are looking a little worse. That is because I'm hungry. Oh, how thoughtless of me. I should have remembered that when one is going to lead an entirely new life, one requires regular and wholesome meals. Won't you come in? Oh, thank you. Uh, might I have a buttonhole first? I find I never really have any appetite unless I've had a buttonhole first. A Marichal Niel? No, I'd sooner have a pink rose. Why? Because you would like a pink rose, Cousin Cecily. No, I don't think it can be right for you to talk to me like that. Miss Prism never says such things to me. Then Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. You're the prettiest girl I ever saw. Miss Prism says that all good looks are a snare. They're a snare that every sensible man should like to be caught in. Oh, I don't think I would care to catch a sensible man. I shouldn't know what to talk to him about. <laughs> Dr. Chargeable, you should get married. A misanthrope I can understand. A woman throat, never. 
Oh, believe me, I do not deserve so neologistic a phrase. The precept, as well as the practice of the primitive church, was distinctly against matrimony. Well, that is obviously the reason why the primitive church has not lasted up to the present day. And you do not realize, dear doctor, that by persistently remaining single, a man converts himself into a permanent public temptation. <laughs> Men should be more careful. This very celibacy leads weaker vessels astray. But isn't a man equally attractive when married? Oh, no married man is ever attractive, <laughs> except to his wife. And often I've been told not even to her. <laughs> that depends on the intellectual sympathies of the woman. Majority can be depended upon. Rightness can be trusted. Young women are green. I spoke horticulturally. <laughs> My metaphor was drawn from fruits. <laughs> but where is Cecily? Perhaps she followed us to the schools. Mr. Worthing! Mr. Worthing? This is indeed a surprise. We did not look for you till Monday afternoon. I have returned sooner than I expected. <laughs> Dr. Chasuble, I hope you are well. Dear Mr. Worthing, I trust this garb of woe does not betoken some terrible calamity. My brother. More shameful deaths and extravagance. Still leading a life of pleasure. Dead. Your brother Ernest dead. Quite dead. What a lesson for him. I trust he will profit by it. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, I extend to you my sincere condolence. You have at least the consolation of knowing you are always the most generous and forgiving of brothers. Poor Ernest. He had many faults, but it is a sad, sad blow. Very sad indeed. Were you with him at the end? No, he died abroad. In Paris, in fact. I had a telegram last night from the manager of the Grand Hotel. Was the cause of death mentioned? A severe chill, it seems. As a man sows, so shall he reap. Charity. Dear Mr. Charity. None of us are perfect. I myself am peculiarly susceptible to drafts. <laughs> Will the interment take place here? No. Uh, he seems to have expressed a desire to be buried in Paris. In Paris. Well, that hardly points to any very serious state of mind at the last. <laughs> you would no doubt wish me to make some slight allusion to this tragic domestic affliction next Sunday. My sermon on the meaning of the manor in the wilderness could be adapted to almost any occasion. <laughs> Joyous, or as in the present case, <coughs> distressing. I have preached it at harvest celebrations, christenings, confirmations, <laughs> days of humiliation, and festival days. The last time I delivered it was at the cathedral as a charity sermon for the Society for the Prevention of Discontent among the Upper Orders. <laughs> the bishop who was present was much struck by some of the analogies I drew. Ah, oh, that reminds me. You mentioned christenings, I think, Dr. Chasuble. I suppose you know how to christen, all right? I mean, of course, you are continually christening, aren't you? It is, I regret to say, one of the rector's most constant duties in this parish. I have often spoken to the poor court classes on the subject, but they don't seem to know what thrift is. Was there any particular infant you had in mind, Mr. Worthing? I understand your brother was unmarried, was he not? Oh, yes. People who live entirely for pleasure usually are. But it is not for any child, dear doctor. I am very fond of children. Now, the fact is, I would like to be christened myself this afternoon, if you have nothing better to do. But surely you have been christened already. I don't remember anything about it. But have you any grave doubts on the subject? I certainly intend to have. Of course, I don't know if the thing would bother you in any way, or if you think I'm a little too old now. Not at all, not at all. The sprinkling, and indeed the immersion of adults, is a perfectly canonical practice. Immersion? You need have no apprehensions. Sprinkling is all that is necessary. Or indeed, I think advisable. Our weather is so changeable. <laughs> At what hour would you like the ceremony performed? Oh, I might trot around about five, if that would suit you. Admirably, admirably. As a matter of fact, I have two similar ceremonies to perform at that hour. A case of twins that occurred in one of the outlying cottages on your own estate. Poor Jenkins the carter. 
most hard-working man. Oh, I did. don't see much fun in being christened along with other babies. It would be childish. <laughs> would half past five do? Perfectly. And now, dear Mr. Worthing, I will not intrude any longer into a house of sorrow. I would merely beg you to be not too much bowed down by grief. What seem to us bitter trials are often blessings in disguise. This seems to me a blessing of an extremely obvious kind. <laughs> Uncle Jack! Oh, I am pleased to see you back, but what horrid clothes you have got on! <laughs> Do go and change them. Cecily! Dear child. What is the matter, Uncle Jack? Do look happy. You look as if you had toothache, and I have got such a surprise for you. Who do you think is in the dining room? Your brother! <laughs> Who? Your brother Ernest. He arrived about half an hour ago. That's nonsense. I haven't got a brother. Oh, don't say that. <laughs> However badly you may have behaved to you in the past, he is still your brother. You couldn't be so heartless as to disown him. I'll tell him to come out, and you will shake hands with him, won't you, Uncle Jack? <laughs> <laughs> These are very joyful tidings. <laughs> After we had all been resigned to his loss, his sudden return seems peculiarly distressing. The opera is in the dining room. I don't know what it all means. I think it is perfectly absurd. Good heavens! Brother John, I have come down from town to tell you that I am very sorry for all the trouble I've given you in the past and that I intend to lead a better life in the future. Mm. Uncle Jack, you are not going to refuse your own brother's hand. Nothing will induce me to take his hand. I think his coming down here disgraceful. He knows perfectly well why. Uncle Jack, do be nice. There is some good in everyone. Ernest has just been telling me about his poor invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury. <laughs> <laughs> he goes to visit so often. And surely there must be much good in one who is kind to an invalid and leaves the pleasures of London to sit by a bed of pain. Uh, he has been talking about Bunbury, has he? Yes, he told me all about poor Mr. Bunbury and his terrible state of health. Bunbury? Well, I won't have him talk to you about Bunbury or about anything else. It is enough to drive one perfectly frantic. Of course, I admit the faults were all on my side, but I must say I find Brother John's coldness to be peculiarly painful. I had expected a more enthusiastic welcome, especially seeing as this is the first time I have ever come here. Uncle Jack, if you don't shake hands with Ernest, I'll never forgive you. <laughs> never forgive me? Never, never, never. Yeah, this is the last time I shall ever do it. <clears throat> it is pleasant to see so perfect a reconciliation. <laughs> We might leave the two brothers together. Cecily, you will come with us. Certainly, Miss Prism. My little task of reconciliation is over. You have done a beautiful action today, dear child. <laughs> we must not be premature in our judgment. I feel very happy. <laughs> you young scoundrel, Algy. You must get out of this place as soon as possible. I don't allow any bungling here. <laughs> Place Mr. Ernest's things next to yours. I suppose that's all right. What? Mr. Ernest's luggage, sir. I have unpacked it and placed it in the room next to your own. His luggage? Yes, sir. Three portmanteaus, a dressing case, two hat boxes, and a large luncheon basket. I'm afraid I can't stay more than a week this time. <laughs> Madam, and have a car brought round at once. Mr. Ernest has been suddenly called back to town. Yes, sir. What a fearful liar you are, Jack. I've not been called back to town at all. Yes, you have. I haven't had anyone call me. Your duty as a gentleman calls you back. My duty as a gentleman has never interfered with my pleasures in the smallest degree. <laughs> I can quite understand that. And Cecily is a darling. You are not to talk of Miss Carr to you like that. I don't like it. Well, I don't like your clothes. I think you look perfectly ridiculous in them. Why on earth don't you go up and change, hmm? It is perfectly childish you're being in deep mourning for a man who is actually staying with you in your house for a whole week as a guest. I call it grotesque. You are certainly not staying with me for a whole week as a guest or anything else. You have got to leave. 
like a four-five train. Well, I certainly won't leave so long as you were in mourning. It would be most unfriendly of me. Yeah, you would stay with me, I suppose. I was in mourning. I think it most unkind if you didn't. Well, will you go if I change my clothes? Yes, if you are not too long about it. I never saw anyone take so long to dress and with so little result. Well, at any rate, that is better than always being overdressed as you are. If I am occasionally a little overdressed, I make up for it by being always immensely overeducated. <laughs> your vanity is ridiculous. Your conduct and outrage, and your presence in my garden, utterly absurd. <laughs> However, you have got to catch the 4-5, and I hope you will have a pleasant journey back to town. This bundling, as you call it, has not been a great success for you. I think it has been a great success. I'm in love with Cecily, and that is everything. <laughs> But I must see her before I go and make arrangements for another Bunbury. <laughs> ah, there she is. Oh, I mean you came back to water the roses. I thought you were with Uncle Jack. He's going to order a car for me. He's going to send me away. Then have you got your part? I'm afraid so. It is a very painful parting. It is always painful to part from people whom one has known for a very brief space of time. <laughs> <laughs> the absence of old friends one can endure with equanimity. But even a momentary separation from anyone to whom one has just been introduced is almost unbearable. <laughs> the car's at the door, sir. It can wait, Marilyn, for five minutes. Yes, miss. I hope I shall not offend you, Cecily, if I say quite openly and frankly that you seem to me in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection. I think your frankness does you great credit, Ernest. If you will allow me, I will copy your remarks into my diary. Do you really keep a diary? I'd give anything to look at it. May I? Oh, no. You see, it is simply a very young girl's record of her own thoughts and impressions, and consequently meant for publication. When it, when it appears in volume form, I hope you will order a copy. But pray, Ernest, don't stop. I delight in taking down from dictation. I have reached absolute perfection. You can go on, I'm quite ready for more. <coughs> oh, don't cough, Ernest. When one is dictating, one should speak fluently and not cough. Besides, I don't know how to spell cough. Cecily, ever since I first gazed upon your wonderful and incomparable beauty, I have dared to love you. Why? Oh, I don't think you should tell me you love me wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Hopelessly doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? Uh, Cecily! The car is at the door, sir. It, it can come round next week at the same hour. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Uncle Jack would be very much annoyed if he knew you were staying on until next week at the same hour. I don't care about Jack. I don't care about anybody in the whole world. But you, I love you, Cecily. You will marry me, won't you? Oh, you silly boy, of course. <laughs> Why, we have been engaged for the last three months. Uh, <laughs> for, for the last three months? <laughs> yes, it will be exactly three months on Thursday. Um, but, but how did we <laughs> become engaged? Well, Ever since dear Uncle Jack first confessed to us that he had a younger brother who was very wicked and bad, you of course have formed the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prism. And of course a man who is much talked about is always very attractive. One feels there must be something in him after all. I dare say it was foolish of me, but I fell in love with you, Ernest. Uh, darling, <laughs> and when was the engagement actually set? On the 14th of February last. Worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, I determined to end the matter one way or the other, and after a long struggle with myself, I accepted you under a dear old tree here. The next day I bought this little ring in your name, and this is the bangle with the true lover's knot that I promised you always to wear. Oh, it's very pretty. Did I give you this? Oh, yes, you wonderfully oh. good taste, Ernest. <laughs> it is the excuse I have always given for your leading such a bad life. And this is the dear 
a box in which I keep all your letters. My letters? I've never written you any letters. Oh, you hardly need remind me of that, Ernest. I remember only too well that I was forced to write your letters for you. I wrote always three times a week, and sometimes oftener. Do let me read oh, them. Oh, I couldn't possibly. They would make you far too conceited. The three you wrote after I had broken off our engagement are so beautiful and so badly spelled that even now I can hardly read them without crying a little. <laughs> was our engagement ever broken off? Of course it was. On the 22nd of last March. You can read the entry if you like. Today I broke off my engagement with Ernest. I feel it is better to do so. The weather still continues charming. <laughs> well, why did you break it off? Uh, what had I done? I had done nothing at all. I must say, I am very much hurt indeed, Cecily, to hear that you broke it off. Especially when the weather was so charming. <laughs> it would hardly have been a really serious engagement if it hadn't been broken off at least once. But I forgave you before the week was out. What a perfect angel you are, Cecily. You dear romantic boy. I don't want to ever break off our engagement again, will you? I don't think I could, now that I've actually met you. And besides, there is the question of your name. Oh, yes, of course. Oh, you must not laugh at me, darling. But it had always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone whose name was Ernest. There is something in that name that seems to inspire absolute confidence. I pity any poor married woman whose husband is not called Ernest. Do you really mean to say you couldn't love me if I had? Some other name. But what name? Oh, any name you like. Uh, Algernon, for instance. Oh, but I don't like the name of Algernon. <laughs> but, but my own. <laughs> Sweet, loving, little darling. <laughs> I really can't see any reason you should object to the name of Algernon. It's not a bad name at all. In fact, it is a rather aristocratic name. Uh, more than half the chaps get in the bankruptcy court are called Algernon. <laughs> but seriously, Cecily, if my name was Algernon, couldn't you love me? I might respect you, Ernest. <laughs> I might admire your character, but I fear I should not be able to give you my undivided attention. <clears throat> Cecily, uh, your rector here is, I suppose, uh, thoroughly experienced in all the rites and ceremonials of the church. Oh, yes. Dr. Chasuble is a most learned man. He has never written a single book, so you can imagine how much he knows. I, I must see him at once on a most important christening. I mean, on the most important business. I shan't be more than half an hour. Well, considering that we've been engaged since February the 14th, and um, that I only met you today for the first time, it seems rather hard that you should leave me for so long a period of half an hour. Couldn't you make it 20 minutes? I'll be back in no time. <laughs> Petrous boy he is. I like his hair so much. I must get his proposal in my diary. Uh, Miss Fairfax has called to see Mr. Worthing on very important business, Miss Fairfax states. Is it Mr. Worthing in his library? Uh, Mr. Worthing went up in the direction of the rectory some time ago. Pray, ask the lady to come out here. Mr. Worthing is sure to be back soon. And you can bring tea. Yes, miss. <coughs> miss Fairfax. I suppose one of the many good elderly women who are associated with Uncle Jack in some of his philanthropic work in London. I don't quite like women who are interested in philanthropic work. I think it is so forward of them. Miss Fairfax. <laughs> Pray, let me introduce myself to you. My name is Cecily Cardew. Cecily Cardew? What a very sweet name. Something tells me we are going to be great friends. I like you already more than I can say. My first impressions of people are never wrong. How nice of you to like me so much after we have known each other such a comparatively short time. Pray, sit down. I may call you Cecily, may I not? With pleasure. And you will always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? If you wish. Then that is all quite settled, is it not? I hope so. Perhaps this might be a favourable opportunity for my mentioning who I am. My father is Lord Bracknell. You have never heard of papa, 
I suppose. I don't think so. Outside the family circle, Papa, I am glad to say, is entirely unknown. I think that is quite as it should be. The home seems to me to be the proper sphere for the man. And certainly, once a man begins to neglect his domestic duties, he becomes painfully effeminate, does he not? And I don't like that. It makes men so very attractive. Cecily, Mama, whose views on education are remarkably strict, has brought me up to be extremely short-sighted. It is part of her system. So do you mind my looking at you through my glasses? Oh, not at all, Gwendolyn. I am very fond of being looked at. <laughs> You are here on a short visit, I suppose. Oh, no, I live here. Really? Your mother, no doubt, or some female relative of advanced years resides here also. Oh, no, I have no mother, nor, in fact, any relation. Indeed. My dear guardian, with the assistance of Miss Prism, has the arduous task of looking after me. Your guardian? Uh, yes, I am Mr. Worthing's ward. Oh. It is strange he never mentioned to me that he had a ward. How secretive of him. He grows more interesting hourly. I am not sure, however, that the news inspires me with feelings of unmixed delight. I am very fond of you, Cecily. I have liked you ever since I met you. But I am bound to state that now that I know that you are Mr. Worthing's ward, I cannot help expressing a wish that you were well, just a little older than you seem to be, and not quite so very alluring in appearance. In fact, if I may speak candidly... Oh, pray do so. I think that whenever anyone has anything unpleasant to say, one should always be quite candid. Well, to speak with perfect candor, Cecily, I wish that you were fully 42 and more than usually plain for your age. <laughs> Ernest has a strong, upright nature. He is the very soul of truth and honor. Disloyalty would be as impossible to him as deception. But even men of the noblest possible moral character are extremely susceptible to the influence of the physical charms of others. Modern, no less than ancient history, supplies us with many most painful examples of what I refer to. If it were not so, indeed, history would be quite unreadable. I beg your pardon, Gwendolyn. Did you say Ernest? Yes. But it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is my guardian. It is his brother, his elder brother. Ernest never mentioned to me that he had a brother. Uh, I am sorry to say they have not been on good terms for a long time. Oh, that accounts for it. And now that I think of it, I have never heard any man mention his brother. The subject seems distasteful to most men. Cecily, you have lifted a load from my mind. I was growing almost anxious. It would have been terrible if any cloud had come across a friendship like ours, would it not? Of course, you are quite, quite sure that it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is your guardian. Quite sure. In fact, I am going to be his. I beg your pardon? Dearest Gwendolyn, there is no reason I should make a secret of it to you. Our little county newspaper is sure to chronicle the fact next week. <laughs> Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. My darling Cecily, I think there must be some slight error. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the Morning Post on Saturday at the latest. I'm afraid you must be under some misconception. Ernest proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. <laughs> it certainly is very curious, for he asked me to be his wife <laughs> yesterday <laughs> afternoon at 5.30. If you would care to verify the incident, pray do so. I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read in the train. <laughs> but I am so sorry, dear Cecily, if it is any disappointment to you, but I am afraid I have the prior claim. It would distress me more than I can tell you, dear Gwendolyn, if it cost you any mental or physical anguish. But I feel bound to point out that since Ernest proposed to you, he clearly has changed his mind. If the poor fellow has been entrapped into any foolish promise, I shall consider it my duty to rescue him at once. 
and with a firm hand. Whatever unfortunate entanglement my dear boy may have brought into, I will never reproach him with it after we are married. You and you to me, Miss Cardew, as an entanglement, you are presumptuous. On an occasion of this kind, it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind. It becomes a pleasure. Do you suggest, Miss Fairfax, that I entrap Ernest into an engagement? How dare you? Now is no time for wearing the shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. I am glad to say that I have never seen a spade. It is obvious that our social spheres have been widely different. <laughs> Shall I lay the table for tea as usual, miss? Yes, as usual. <laughs> Often many interesting walks in the vicinity, Miss Cardew? Oh, yes, a great many. From the top of one of the hills quite close, one can see five counties. Five counties? <laughs> I don't think I should like that. I hate crowds. I suppose that is why you live in town. Quite a well-kept garden this is, Miss Cardew. So glad you like it, Miss Fairfax. I had no idea there were any flowers in the country. Oh, yes, flowers are as common here, Miss Fairfax, as people are in London. Personally, I cannot understand how anybody manages to exist in the country, if anybody who is anybody does. The country always bores me to death. May I offer you some tea, Miss Fairfax? Thank you. Detestable girl, but I require tea. <laughs> Sugar? No, thank you. Sugar is not fashionable anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Please, cake is rarely seen at the best houses nowadays. <laughs> you have filled my tea with lumps of sugar, and though I most Distinctly asked for bread and butter, you have given me cake. <laughs> I am known for the gentleness of my disposition and the extraordinary sweetness of my nature. But I warn you, Miss Cardew, you, you may go too far. To save my poor, innocent, trusting boy from the machinations of any other girl, there are no lengths to which I would not go. From the moment I saw you, I distrusted you. I felt <laughs> that you were false and deceitful. I am never deceived in such matters. My first impressions of people are invariably right. It seems to me, Miss Fairfax, that I am trespassing on your valuable time. No doubt you have many other calls of a similar character to make in the neighborhood. <laughs> Ernest! My own Ernest. Gwendolyn, darling. A moment. May I ask if you are engaged to be married to this young lady? Oh, to dear little Cecily, of course not. What could have put such an idea into your pretty little head? Thank you. You may. I knew there must be some misunderstanding, Miss Fairfax. The gentleman whose arm is at present round your waist is my guardian, Mr. John Worthy. I beg your pardon? This is Uncle Jack. Jack? Oh. <laughs> Here is Ernest. My own love. A moment, Ernest. To be married to this young lady? To what young lady? Good heavens, Gwendolyn! <laughs> yes, to good heavens, Gwendolyn. I mean to Gwendolyn. Of course not. <laughs> what could have put such an idea into your pretty little head? <laughs> Thank you. You may. I felt there was some slight error, Miss Cardew. The gentleman who is now embracing you is my cousin, Mr. Algernon Moncrief. Algernon Moncrief? Oh! Oh, you called Algernon. I cannot deny it. Oh! Is your name really John? I could deny it if I liked. I could deny anything if I liked. 
But my name certainly is John. It has been John for years. Oh, a gross deception has been practised on both of us. My poor wounded Cecily. <laughs> my sweet <laughs> girl. You will call me sister, will you not? <laughs> there is just one question that I would like to be allowed to ask my guardian. An admirable idea. Mr. Worthing, there is just one question I would like to be permitted to put to you. Where is your brother Ernest? We are both engaged to be married to your brother Ernest, <laughs> so it is a matter of some importance to us to know where your brother Ernest is at present. Gwendolyn, Cecily, <laughs> it is very painful for me to be forced to speak the truth. It is the first time in my life that I have ever been reduced to such a painful position, and I am really quite inexperienced in doing anything of the kind. However, I will tell you quite frankly that I have no brother Ernest. <gasps> I have no brother at all. I never had a brother in my life, and I certainly have not the smallest intention of ever having one in the future. <laughs> no brother at all? None. Had you never a brother of any kind? Never. Not even of any kind. <laughs> I am afraid it is quite clear, Cecily, that neither of us is engaged to be married to anyone. It is not a very pleasant position for a young girl suddenly to find herself in, is it? Let us go into the house. They will hardly venture to come after us there. No, men are so cowardly, aren't they? This ghastly state of things is what you call bunburying, I suppose. <laughs> yes, the perfectly wonderful bunbury it is. <laughs> Most wonderful bunbury I ever had in my life. <laughs> Well, you've no right whatsoever to Bunbury here. Oh, that is absurd. One has a right to Bunbury anywhere one chooses. Every serious Bunburyist knows this. Serious Bunburyist? Good heavens. Well, one must be serious about something if one wants to have any amusement at all in life. I happen to be serious about Bunbury. What on earth you are serious about? I have the remotest idea. About everything, I should suppose. You have such an absolutely trivial nature. Well, the only small satisfaction I have in the whole of this wretched business is that your friend Bunbury has quite exploded. You won't be able to run down to the country quite so often as you used to, dear Algy. And a very good thing, too. Your brother is a little off colour, isn't he, dear Jack? You won't be able to disappear to London quite so often as your wicked custom was. And not a bad thing, either. As for your conduct towards Miss Cardew, I must say that your taking in a sweet, simple, innocent girl like that is quite inexcusable. To say nothing of the fact that she is my ward. Well, I can see no possible defence at all for your deceiving her. That clever, brilliant, thoroughly experienced young lady like Miss Fairfax. To say nothing of the fact that she is my cousin. I wanted to be engaged to Gwendolyn, that is all. I love her. But I simply wanted to be engaged to Cecily. I adore her. There is certainly no chance of your marrying Miss Cardew. I don't see much likelihood, Jack, of your and Miss Fairfax being united. Well, that is no business of yours. If it was my business, I wouldn't talk about it. It's very vulgar to discuss one's business. Only people like stockbrokers do that. And then only at dinner parties. How you can sit there calmly eating muffins when we are in this horrible trouble, I can't make out. You seem to me to be perfectly heartless. Well, I can't eat muffins in an agitated manner. <laughs> the butter will probably get on my cuffs. Uh, one should always eat muffins quite calmly. It is the only way to eat them. I say it's perfectly heartless you're eating muffins at all under the circumstances. When I am in trouble, eating is the only thing that consoles me. Indeed. <laughs> when I am in really great trouble, as anyone who knows me intimately can tell you, I refuse everything except food and drink. At the present moment, I am eating muffins because I am upset. Besides, I'm particularly fond of muffins. <laughs> well, that is no reason why you should eat them all in that greasy way. I wish you had tea cake instead. I don't like tea cake. Good heavens, I suppose a man may eat his own muffins in his own garden. You just said it was perfectly heartless to eat muffins. I said it was perfectly heartless of you under the circumstances. That is a very different thing. That may be. But the muffins are the same. <laughs> Algy, I wish to goodness you would go. You can't possibly ask me to go without having dinner. I never go without my dinner. <laughs> Whatever does, except vegetarians and people like that. <laughs> and besides, I have just made arrangements with Dr. Charleswell to be christened to quarter to six under the name of Ernest. My dear fellow, the sooner you give up that nonsense, the better. I made arrangements this morning with Dr. Charleswell to be christened myself at 5.30, <laughs> and I naturally will take the name of Ernest. Gwendolyn would wish it. 
We can't both be christened Ernest. It's absurd. Besides, I have a perfect right to be christened if I like. There is no evidence at all that I have ever been christened by anybody. I should think it extremely probable I never was, and so does Dr. Charitable. It is entirely different in your case. You have been christened already. Uh, yes, but I have not been christened for years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you have been christened. That is the important thing. Uh, quite so. So I know my constitution can take it. If you have any doubt about your ever having been christened, I think it rather dangerous you're venturing on it now. It, it might make you quite unwell. You can hardly have forgotten someone very closely connected with you was very nearly carried off this week in Paris by a severe chill. Uh, yes, but you said yourself that a severe chill was not hereditary. It usedn't to be, I know, but I dare say it is now. Science is always making wonderful improvements in things. <laughs> that is nonsense. You're always talking nonsense. Jack! They're at the muffins again. I wish you wouldn't. There's only one left. I just told you I'm particularly fond of muffins. But I hate tea cake. Why on earth, then, do you allow it to be served up for your guests? What ideas you have of hospitality? Algernon, I have already told you to go. I don't want you here. Why don't you go? I haven't quite finished my tea yet. <laughs> hmm. And there's still one muffin left. <laughs> <laughs>